Welcome, everybody. Also, on behalf of Daniel Benjamin, the president of the American Academy, who is currently stuck in Cologne, um, reading train schedules and hoping at some point to be able to come back to Berlin. I guess that's because of the storm, um, but he sends his warm greetings. Um, so welcome to tonight's lecture, China, Africa Encounters Historical Legacy and Contemporary Re Realities. Don't be confused with what you see there. Um, this is uh, this is the title. Um, we just uh, we're just experimenting here a little bit with the presentation. It will be given by Helen Sue, our fall 2021 Airbus Distinguished Visitor. Um, the program, as the name suggests, was made possible by Airbus Group by a generous endowment and subsequently um, started in 2009. Um, we are extremely grateful to Airbus um, for bringing Helen Sue uh, to Berlin. And Helen, um, as you all know, is a professor of anthropology and the former chair of the Council of East Asian Studies at Yale University. And she's also the founding director of the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, it's extremely difficult um, to give a present or to narrow down Helen in three to five minutes. It's just impossible. So you will just get a glimpse of her. She, as you know, she has published widely. Her recent publications are Asia Inside Out, three volumes that were published with Harvard University Press, Tracing China, a 40-year ethnographic journey, China Africa Encounters, Historical Legacy and Contemporary Realities, where she <laughs> copied for today, um, <laughs> um, and financing China's engagements in Africa and new state spaces along a variegated landscape. Um, as I said, this is just a glimpse of uh, Helen's genius and her deep thinking. Another pr proof of her genius is the impact um, Helen actually makes on the world. And the world that Helen creates with her teaching, it's actually also here in Berlin. I'm extremely happy that one of her students is uh, among the class of fellows this fall. Um, and this is Samantha Chang, who uh, should be here somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but apart also from having conducted fieldwork and research in and about South, South China since the 1970s, um, Helen would not be Helen if her life just stopped um, in teaching and reading and writing. Um, so she's also the executive producer of the documentary film Denise Ho Becoming the Song, portraying the Hong Kong singer and political activist, and the film explores Denise Ho's journey from being a commercial canto pop superstar to an outspoken pro-democracy political activist. The film uh, premiered in North America and Japan, uh, and Japan in July 2020, but is not yet available in Europe. So um, if you're reluctant at this point to travel to the United States or Japan, uh, the fact that you can watch Helen's film there should be reason enough to go. Um, thank you, Helen, for being here tonight and for giving us an insight um, into your deep thinking. Um, before I hand over to you, allow me just to say a few words about the procedure of this evening. So we have you here. Um, in the audience, and we have a Zoom audience that is joining us from Zoomlandia. The lecture will last for about an hour, followed by an Q&A with all of you here. You will be handed a microphone and can ask questions. Um, our audience in Zoom is kindly invited um, to type in the question in the Q&A uh, window on the Zoom platform. Um, I will then read the questions uh, to Helen, um, who will have to answer. Thank you, Helen. Uh, the floor is yours. And when we will start the lecture, um, you will not be able to look at each other anymore. We will turn off the light so that you can see the presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now I feel normal again, you know, with this I really look like a bandit. So, uh, all right. So thank you, Berit, and I should thank uh, Mr. Benjamin too, and colleagues here at the Academy for uh, making this visit possible. I know it hasn't been easy, and, uh, but I'm here and uh, very glad to meet all of you uh, and some old friends, of course. Um, uh, whenever I'm given a choice to stand behind a lectern, my first question is, how tall is it? <laughs> We're able to lower this so you can all see me. Um, so anyway, you know, just in case, you know. 
Um, so for those expecting me to talk about um, debt and COVID, as was in the introduction, I think you may be disappointed because uh, I'm going to talk about anything but debt and COVID. I think that the, the um, statistical uh, um, records of China's trade and investments in the continent and the key debates um, uh, uh, are very familiar to us, especially the academics working on China or Africa. Um, Deborah Brodigan from um, Johns Hopkins, um, uh, author of a very famous book called Dragon's Gift, um, and her number-crunching team at SAIS uh, um, uh, Kari, which is Johns Hopkins University, they have long argued that China's presence in Africa and the Belt and Road, actually, uh, is largely positive, and that it brings modern development and growth uh, when other options from the West have failed. And, and that pro-China media might have misrepresented China's intentions and impact, um, like on extractive industries, on debt, on land grabbing, and all that kind of issues. But the BBC, The Economist, um, a research lab called Aid Data from um, Williams, William and Marriage College, they have painted a much more varied picture at times challenging the quality of China's products and built infrastructure, uh, the nature of China's loans, like BBC's recent article called uh, is, is China the Big Spender or a Loan Shark? Or the debt trap, um, is showing like lavish loans to elites of these varying indigenous uh, 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 countries and now owe, owed, you know, huge amount uh, to China. I mean, countries like Angola, uh, Ethiopia, Zambia, Republic of Congo, and Sudan. And then, of course, issues of societal displacement because of the infrastructural uh, projects. And so, and that actually extends to South A Southeast Asia, um, uh, such as Laos, such as Sri Lanka, and so on. Um, and journal, uh, journalist and his team and colleagues, um, uh, academic colleagues, and also um, uh, 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 sort of media uh, savvy kind of people have actually argued that China um, today, combining the very market dominance and also um, and also state power, very coordinated state power, has become a much more formidable colonial power today. And that's actually shared by some, uh, I would say, uh, African uh, um, intellectuals, colleagues themselves. Um, uh, a, another journalist by the name of Tom Burgess from Financial Times actually points to individuals who sailed across murky political waters um, to broker unimaginable wealth and influence. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, somebody called Sam Pa, who's actually from uh, China and then Hong Kong, and very closely linked to Sinopec, CITIC, uh, Sonango, and so on in Angola. And so it leaves lots of questions, gnawing questions about debt, how, 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 how the debt is being written off, and then the loss of sovereignty by some of these societies. Um, there are some truth in all these views, I would say, pro and con. Um, let us, uh, but I think, uh, depending how one interprets, uh, um, collects and interprets the data, but they have largely focused on an administratively uh, uh, defined Chinese, Chinese regime and those within the, the African continents or even individual states. So it's either China, Africa, or individual states within Africa. So it's very administratively defined research subjects. I think I, tonight I propose um, 
to approach the issue from a slightly different angle. Let us extend our analytical gaze far beyond the two continents uh, to fully appreciate Chinese strategies and complex balancing act in Africa, both hard and soft, small scale and large scale, um, I think one needs to disaggregate uh, the entity we name China and also insert a vast maritime uh, Asia, quote unquote, in between. That's, I already moved a little too forward, but that's okay. So, um, 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 and so, um, to me, uh, um, this is a much larger conceptual mapping of China-Africa encounters with component parts um, that are crucial to China's activities in, a in Africa. Um, how these parts relate to one another and to China may not have been given adequate attention. I mean, if we are stuck with this kind of static land-based, land-based, you know, China, Africa kind of, of framework. Uh, this Asia that I'm proposing uh, is not just a geographical category, but a region made up of layers of multi-ethnic historical experiences, um, cultural energies, legal institutions, and political contest, from the age of empires to age of nation states, and today to the age of late socialist uh, globalization, as you know, exemplified by China. So for China to realize its economic and political goals in Africa, multiple Chinese agents, state and private, big and small, they work through a matrix, I think I want to emphasize the word matrix, matrix of checks and balances um, in an overall strategy spanning an entire inter-Asia oceanscape. So I'm going to talk about water, lots of water. Uh, it was that way in historical eras uh, when China was just one among many players. To, but today, in varying degrees, these relationships still operate, but China has now become the visibly the dominant power and also stakeholder. So adding humanist substance, which we anthropologists do, I think Ricky, uh, my colleagues know well, uh, um, we, I, I think adding humanist content may point to some analytical pitfalls of studies relying largely on quantitative data and on investment figures and on physical hardware, and also, of course, on the capacity of research extraction. Uh, these are, you know, the kind of, of work that you see in Deborah Brodigan and some other, I would say, uh, policy think tanks. I think a more multi-dimensional mapping of the social historical landscapes and cultural ethos in unexpected places you know, from Confucius Institutes to Wolf Warrior II in the film, to African entrepreneurship in fintech such as Opay and Mi Pizza, all those, I think, will provide new ways of seeing opportunities, um, choke points, and vulnerabilities in China's strategies and intentions. So it also applies to the initiative uh, for and the structural consequences for these African partners as well. So colleagues have asked me many times, actually, why after decades of research in China, uh, about four and a half decades, um, I have now gone to the Middle East and out of all places to Africa. I mean, a place I hardly ever, I hardly know. Uh, my answer is conceptual, you know, I said, to me, China is not a, an entity with a hard physical administrative boundary, but it's a process. So what, whenever and wherever uh, exciting issues arise from these processes, I wish to be there uh, to examine the nuance and the flux. Even race is not a black and white issue. One reads media reports, 
you know, on anti-Chinese riots in Algerian markets, uh, over the eating of pork, and over immoral dress. Tensions over labor conditions in Zambia surprised a lot of the Chinese investors, uh, but the, the Chinese investors might not have known the, the labor union tradition under colonial periods. Um, then, um, then there are all sorts of complaints about the Chinese gold diggers um, um, in Ghana on environmental concerns and on local livelihoods, or rumors in cyberspace, so to speak, in Kinshasa, about grotesquely deformed uh, mystical mermaids they called Mami Wata. Uh, they are dug up by Chinese workers who were laying down underwater cables. So all these things were going on the ground, as we can see it in Africa. Or even a murdered woman trader uh, 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 of, uh, of imitation African textile, sub suspected of, you know, by uh, unsympathetic competition, uh, competitors, uh, locals, um, of making a peck with the devil, deals with Chinese drug rackets in Togo, West Africa. So, or even closer to home, when we come back to the African communities in Guangzhou, you know, when there's the, the time of Ebola and COVID and SARS, and even about the very, very uh, unfriendly attitudes towards mixed race children. So in the urban villages of Guangzhou. So the Chinese regime preoccupied with the market shares of its state-owned enterprises or of cultivating allies to extend nationalistic influence in the UN or even in the WHO, it might have missed popular sentiments and possible political turmoil on, turmoil on the ground. Um, I think this omission in the end may have very serious consequence for China's long-term goals. So in the interest of time, um, I think I'll just go directly um, to, the, um, to the PowerPoint, because I, what I want to do is to walk you through a few centuries of happenings in a maritime world that had long bridged uh, two continents and continued, uh, continued to shape their presence uh, and future. So bear with me, we're just going to walk out our way from southern China all the way across Interasia to Africa and back to Guangzhou and Hong Kong. I really want to spend some time to talk about how the collapse of civil society and probably the damage done to, the, to Hong Kong's role as a, an Asian financial hub for China you know, uh, um, in the past couple years may not serve China's interests. So I hope to show a little bit at least on issues on Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a crucial component in this overall Chinese uh, strategy to reach globally. Is it okay? So that's basically what it is. It's just slides mostly I took uh, um, as I walk the, 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 this huge interracial region and see how far we go. I even have some pop music to play <laughs> if people are interested in Denise Ho, as, as, you know, in the film. Is it okay? So, all right. So I'm still trying to learn how to uh, uh, sort of move around with this. Um, so can I go back? So I start out with a, a poem, W.H. Auden as I walked out one evening. It's a love poem, um, and it's, you know, da, 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 and then it's that love has no ending. Till I love you, dear, I love you, until China and Africa meet. Well, his political, uh, his poetic imagination might have led him astray, as I said, because the continent, continental divides were long bridged over the centuries. So, there is a variegated landscape along the Belt and Road that we need to pay attention to. Mobility across the valleys, the sands, the deserts, and the mountains. This is a 15th century painting I 
I found in the Imperial Palace Museum in Istanbul, showing, you know, on the, on the left, you know, a, a Chinese, uh, the marriage of a Chinese princess along the Silk Road. You could see, you know, bandits looking behind the sand dunes. You could see the Mongolian uh, garrison. You can see multi-ethnic ceramic traders and so on and so forth. So that was just a point. This is 1400s. And the pictures I took of deserts in Xinjiang uh, uh, years back, um, camels, you know, my colleague Valerie Hansen actually told me that this is definitely Xinjiang and Central Asia because the camels has, ha have two humps rather than one, as you can see in the Middle East. I wouldn't have known, but she knows. Um, and then, so very arid, very dry. But then, you know, along the, these uh, Belt and Road, you also see lush green valleys and rice terraces, very sophisticated agriculture way back in time. And of course, you see ethnic market women, you know, going from one valley to another, uh, going along the rivers and so on. So it's a very vibrant, varied ecology, human ecology, with lots of things uh, going on over the centuries. I'm going to rush through because it's, these are just nice little images. And then Maritime Asia, uh, a global past, that's what I want to say. Historical linkages between Southern China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Gulf region, Africa, who were doing their traveling? Well, traders, a lot of traders, Tamils, Arabs, Portuguese, Dutch, British. The Chinese were there, uh, but it was amount it was only one among many players. Um, but because of that, there's a lot of give and take in and cultural fusion. So that was the landscape then, centuries and centuries until the recent uh, 50 or even 30 years. Historical flows, let's go back in time, 200 BC almost. You know, this was a, a motif dug out from some artifacts in a museum in Guangzhou um, about 30 years ago. And this was the grandson of, of a, 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 a military uh, a general who marched south from the north um, with his army of 50,000 supposedly um, and declared himself king of the Southern China. And this is the, the tomb, uh, to something from the tomb of his grandson. You could tell a very maritime, you know. Uh, sorry, I'm 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 one slide off. Yeah, uh, um, it's I don't need to go back, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So this is very very maritime uh, 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 ecology then. But then you see uh, um, a silverware, very rare silverware, which archaeologists trace it back to the Persian Empire. So how did this thing get to the tomb of this person, you know, in 200 BC times? So probably over the ocean, not over land, but there it is. But then let's jump centuries. Uh, let's talk about uh, um, a, a temple built in Guangzhou, on the edge of the waters in 594 AD. So this is, you know, uh, sixth century. Um, South Asian connections in, in, this, in the Cantonese folk religion. This is the temple. Temple of what, what we call the Nanhai Shen Miao. Uh, temple for the god of the South Seas. is a temple for commerce, god of commerce. Elegant, beautiful given a lot of official endowment over the centuries. Um, but like all Chinese temples, there's a, a whole pantheon of the gods that they worship inside one temple. That's one of them, very unusual. Um, and many Chinese scholars in the past centuries were trying to guess who this guy came from. The original statue was like this, but you know, they remade this. Um, and after a while, people could, could sort of conjecture, con, uh, uh, guess that this was a Tamil, so the Southern Asia, uh, uh, South Asian, who came to Guangzhou through the ocean, you know, past the Indian Ocean, Strait of Malacca, and up the South China Sea to Guangzhou. But the ship returned home without him. 
He waited and died there. And then for the next 15 centuries was worshiped by little old ladies in, in, in Guangzhou. And was become, he was a legendary figure. And he was given these uh, um, official titles by the empires. And then, you know, given to, uh, uh, this very elegant Chinese robe. So that's the kind of cultural fusion. There's a lot of give and take then. But there's also mask in the age, of, you know, from the 8th century all the way to the 14th, maybe, the Arabs dominated the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the Indian Ocean trade, and many of them made their way over, uh, you know, again, Southeast Asia, Tranjo, Malacca, all the, you know, Malacca and all that, and all the way ended up in a place called Tranjo in Fujian. Uh, Tranjo today, you know, is a huge city. Even in the 1500, uh, in the 15th century, it was a, a city of over a million, and there were Muslim uh, quarters, Muslim schools, mosques, and all sorts of multi-ethnic elites. So that is, you know, uh, um, you know, the age of empire under the Arabs. And so, sure enough, in Guangzhou, you find mosques and Muslim cemeteries. This is one of them built in the Tang Dynasty, supposedly. Um, still with, you could see the familiar, uh, is it what you call turret? You know, the, 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 the tower, uh, but very Chinese architectural uh, uh, um, forms, you know, surrounding it as part of the mosque. Um, that's the historical China, uh, um, Muslim um, uh, cemetery. And inside, um, um, that's the, the mosque inside the, the cemetery. And it's built like a Chinese ancestral hall. You know, the, you know that is, you know, you could see the Arabic uh, uh, over there, you know, and the entrance. But on top of religion, you also have legal scholar, Ibn Battuta, uh, somebody from Tangier, uh, um, a jurist, uh, um, a legal, uh, you know, legal scholar who traveled all over uh, uh, for 25 years from Africa, made his way through to Egypt and the Middle East to Mecca, and then down to you know, Mozambique, and then all the way to, to India, stayed there under the Sultan, some Sultans, and then working as a judge, and then eventually made his way to Guangzhou, Chuanzhou, and possibly Hangzhou, so all the coastal cities of, of, of China. We're talking about 14th century. In, in a very Eurocentric view of world history, you know, we all learned about um, Marco Polo, but you know, not too many talked about Ibn Battuta. There he was supposedly in some paintings uh, in Egypt. He probably traveled most of his trips along the coast on these uh, uh, no, dows, you know, very much used in the Gulf area because it needs, you know, because it, shallow water, you know, because the big Chinese chunks, chunks could not get into the shallow water of the Gulf. Um, and then probably traveling with all sorts of goods, bulk goods, grain and spices and so on and so forth. That's his roots, you know, from Tangier all the way through for 25 years. Um, that's, you know, supposedly he made to, it to Beijing, but it's not, you know, historically, you know, it is still subject to argument. So after he returned to Tangier, the, the Sultan of Morocco, you know, ordered him to write down his travels in, in you know, and so a younger scholar, you know, he dictated it to this uh, younger scholar, and there it was, you know, a very, very amazing historical document. And so that's what's happening then, you know, up to the 14th, 15th century. Um, and then, of course, China did it, it, its own, uh, uh, um, the Chinese did its own um, trips too. Um, that's the very famous Admiral Zhang He, a Muslim himself, uh, sent by the second emperor of Ming Dynasty to look for a young emperor whose throne, you know, this emperor us usurped. And so supposedly, you know, Emperor Zhang He made seven trips all the way to Africa, you know, down the oceans and to Africa, looking, you know, showing off 
the commodities, the treasures of China and so on. But he was actually commissioned to look for, you know, the young emperor and probably, probably kill him, you know, but they never found him. Um, but in the meantime, for the seven trips, China really showed, you know, this part of the world, its wealth. I mean, just look at the picture of these Chinese junks sailed by Admiral Zhang He and the little one that's the Christopher Columbus used across the Atlantic. So there it is, you know, we're talking about the 15th century, so to speak. Um, Chinese commodities ended up, made their way to Africa along these maritime inter-Asian routes, you know, and here they are, some of the fragments I found in Zanzibar and in Oman, uh, in the museums. You know, when we were there in Zanzibar and Oman, you know, my colleague Eric Tagugroso from Cornell and I, you know, part of the team, we were looking for these fragments and thinking that we might still find some, you know, treasures, you know, the, the Ming, you know, blue white, you know, ceramics, but we didn't find that many. Uh, but then, you know, in, in Zanzibar, in the, um, in, um, in the museums, we also found these historical Guangzhou ceramics. Um, because one look at it, you know, coming from, from uh, uh, the Southern area, uh, Cantonese, I mean, this is very typical 18th century, I think, you know, my, my, my colleagues in art history can correct me, but this looks like very much the color, colorful ceramics of um, 18th century uh, Chinese pieces made by Chinese craftsmen. And there are other objects sort of out of place. Uh, I want to show a few. A giraffe that uh, Admiral Zhang He, in his second trip, I think, brought back to the Ming Emperor in Nanjing. Now, how that poor animal got his way all the way through the, 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 the storms and the seas and the shipwrecks and all that, I have no idea. But there it was uh, by a, obviously, a, a, a tender, or a local tender, but supposedly from Somalia, uh, uh, ended up in Bengal, and then it was given as a gift by a sultan in Bengal to the Ming Emperor. And so Admiral Zhang He brought it back to Nanjing, and nobody knew what this strange animal was. They think that it's the mythical, myth, mythical uh, animal called Qilin, you know, in the Chinese legends. But there it was. Then, even more surprising to, to talk about the connections with, uh, uh, with Asia. This is a sea lord, a very formidable sea lord who were occupying Formosa, you know, the former name for Taiwan, um, um, and his famous black gods. He had 500 of them, you know, the, the, the you know, uh, uh, Zhang Zhilong himself was actually, um, uh, he, he, he grew up in Macau already by then, you know, quite in, uh, you know, sort of, you, you could see the Arabs and the Portuguese were sort of getting there. Um, he grew up there. He was Christian as a Catholic, and he recruited these black gods in Macau. These are probably, you know, freed slaves, Arab slaves um, uh, from Africa, and then joined him as mercenaries. And they really, really fought for him, and they were his bodyguards. There was, you know, some of the sea lord you know, in Taiwan, right? Um, but if you really think hard, I mean, these people were not people out of place. They were organically right in their natural place because that was what the interracial uh, uh, movements and fluid, fluidities were. Um, nothing, you know, ab abnormal or, or unusual there. Um, this is in Kerala, in Kochi, you know, Chinese fishnets. Now we're moving towards South Asia here. And then we go down Southeast Asia. This is a picture I took in Penang, in one of the biggest, you know, uh, um, uh, ancestral halls in, in, in Chinese lineages in Penang. And that was guarded by these statues of Sikh gods, Indian Sikh gods. So it's very, very fusion in every sense of the word. And I, we found more of them in the Chinese cemeteries uh, up the hill of Penang City. 
there they were. So, but it's not just traders uh, doing all this and taking objects with them, but then the sites of connection we need to pay attention to because somehow they are nodes, they are hubs. And I thought it's interesting to just show a few slides on these cities uh, uh, along the way, uh, Macau, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, each joining this whole inter arena from very different colonial histories. So that itself is very, very important. Portuguese, Macau, 17th century, multi-ethnic settlements, Chinese, Arabs, Africans, and this is the physical, the begin, the early physical, you know, very European uh, 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 image of Mac Macau um, as a city. And later uh, uh, in the 19th century, you see, you know, you still see a lot of these Catholic churches, and they still stand today. Uh, Macau has a very, very good preservation history because uh, the real estate isn't very expensive and so they, afford, they can afford, unlike Hong Kong, they can afford to preserve a lot of these beautiful historical um, uh, um, you know, buildings. Guangzhou, uh, Guangzhou of course was a city hooked to the world much longer, um, but in the 18th century and 19th century, it became a very, very important hub for the China trade. Um, China was a world factory even then, uh, there were Chinese merchants, um, they were trading in all sorts of things, uh, 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 getting uh, clients from Europe, from uh, the Gulf and, and the Middle East and elsewhere. So these are what they call the, China, uh, the foreign factories in Guangzhou, each representing by nations. By now, 18th, 19th century, you're talking about the age of nation states. They all have traders representing the national interest. And they were all there in Guangzhou. These were the Chinese merchants uh, uh, dealing exclusively with the, uh, with the uh, uh, foreign traders and extremely wealthy because they're virtual monopoly. And then these are the tea trade. You could see in the pictures, you see uh, uh, Chinese laborers uh, transporting tea. And then you see the European uh, uh, clients signing contracts, and then you see the Chinese mandarins, and also, you know, on the very far uh, uh, here, um, and then also uh, traders. And not only tea, but the European clients were ordering, you know, um, these wallpaper and, and Western style furniture, but made, handmade by Cantonese, you know, craftsmen, beautiful crafts, you know, that, that was just the world standard at that time and sought after everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so these are ceramics too. Uh, this is really not the shape of a Chinese teapot, but this is really, you could tell what, who it is for. And then there's also a, a Arabic, you know, clients, you know, I don't know how the Arabic patterns were actually, you know, sort of fired and, and, and put on the, these plates, but there they are. And of course, European styles, uh, chinoiserie, uh, there it was. Um, and all made by Chinese craftsmen with a, you know, for European and, and, and Middle Eastern clients, but with a Chinese touch. And so that was Guangzhou. And then Hong Kong came at the last of these hubs, you know, under the British, in the mid 19th century on. But still it was a multi, you know, it's a multi-ethnic colonial encounter and a very urban beginning. From day one, Hong Kong was an urban hub. But beyond trade, you could also see sea lords because it's a very maritime area. And so, you know, this is a pirate Zhang Bao, you know, you call him a sea lord, you call him pirates, you call him traders, all depends on, 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 the, on the fortunes of the dynasty. Then he was battling the, 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 the Qing dynasty troops um, on the waters of Hong Kong, um, you know, before Hong Kong became Hong Kong, of course. Um, and so how do people trade across these, you know, continents and, and, and countries? And, um, and it's very interesting because most of the silver used for the trade 
came from Mexico, from the New World. You know, how to measure equivalent value if they were minted in different mints. I mean, here you see a US one in 1876. You see a Japanese one a little later, early 20th century. You also see one very, very mutilated, um, which is what we call in, 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 in the Southern China called the yin yang, that is the, the eagle silver coin, Mexican silver dollar. And the, the one at the bottom is also, but that was when uh, uh, Mexico, Mexico was still under the, the, the Spanish uh, colonial powers. So here they are. And it's very interesting to show the, the one that's mutilated. It's a Mexican silver dollar. And the reason uh, um, there are all these Chinese words stamped on it, basically is for these Chinese uh, uh, native bankers to guarantee with their shop's seal to say that we guarantee that it has, you know, uh, the certain standard uh, 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 content of silver. Because, you know, they can be all fake. I mean, who, who can tell whether you're trading equivalent value? That's how in the absence of, of a single standard of law, of commercial uh, 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 regulations, that's how people did that to carry on this very vibrant trade. But then also uh, uh, traders have to live. And here you would see across the continents. Now this is Guangzhou. I mean, the, the foreign uh, um, trading houses burnt down in the 18, early 1800s and never rebuilt. That's the downtown Hong Kong in the late 19th century, early 20th century, actually, or even later. But, it's very, very Mughal. I mean, <laughs> there's the St. John's Cathedral and there's all these other architectural forms. This is, you know, Pearl River Delta, Southern China, towards the, the, the Western part of the province, are uh, built by Chinese merchants who, were, who made their wealth in Southeast Asia. But they came home, they built their, their houses, not like the, um, not like the Chinese architectural style. This is you know, still very much slightly Western. The more, you know, in the heart of the Delta, you know, this is a municipality today, very near Guangzhou. Um, this is the downtown Shiqi, which is uh, uh, early 20th century. I mean, here this is Macau. And then mosque in, downtown Hong Kong. I mean, this is the mid-levels where we still have this uh, uh, temple, which used to be built for the Alaska. These are Indian Ocean multi-ethnic sailors in the 19th century. You know, when they ended up in, in Hong Kong, that's where they, they hang around. Um, and, uh, and then further, going further, that's Mumbai. These are mansions you know, owned at the time uh, in probably early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century by Parsis from Mumbai. And if you think about a little detail, a little detail, 1865, when HSBC was formed, was established in Hong Kong, registered, out of, I think, 13 or 11 uh, um, board members, and of course, Scottish bankers and all that, there were three Parsi merchants. So this is what we're talking about you know, in the world then. Mm -hmm. So let's go very quickly. How much time do I have? I just want to, yeah, I'm still, uh, give me about another 20 minutes. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. So we jump right into the 20th century, uh, 21st century. So at, as I said, you know, before China was a player, but it was not the dominant player. There's a lot of give and take culturally, economically, and obviously politically. But today, this is what we see. AIIB, the, uh, uh, the what's the main uh, uh, Asian Infrastructural Investment Bank set up in 2007, 16, I think, uh, 2016 in Beijing, headquartered there. And look at the membership in blue. These are the members of AIIB, the, the established by China, basically to counter the World Bank and IMF and, uh, and other Western 
based uh, banks. Uh, this is the Indian Ocean uh, uh, power balance changing. Um, the, the ones in the red is basically special economic zones and China's uh, uh, sort of dominant ports from Djibouti in the Horn of Africa to Guada port in Pakistan to Sri Lanka now, the port that's called um, uh, Hamban Toto, uh, that China secured 99 years of management rights. Um, and then of course, uh, Myanmar uh, and the South China Sea. Uh, you see some uh, American flags there and then some further down the Aussies, you know, the, the Australians further down and then India. So it's a very, very mixed uh, uh, um, Indian Ocean Con now you know, controlled by multiple uh, 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 part parties, but it's interesting to see whose power is on the rise and whose power is on the decline. I mean, that's the important point here. Guadaport, that the special economic zone that Pakistan helped, uh, uh, China helped develop uh, 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 Pakistan in 2015. And of course, China gained a lot of rights to use the, the port and who knows eventually probably to to have mm -hmm. military uh, uh, purposes and that's a, 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 a highway supposedly called um, the uh, China Pakistan uh, economic corridor um, developing from the, the the port down south all the way through Pakistan um, and then eventually linked up, you know, well, of course, to Islamabad and then uh, gradually into the southwestern or western China, like Tibet and Xinjiang and so on. So that is a strategy for China, eventually, that in case of a war in Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, you know, all the oil and the food and whatever minerals and all that from Africa and from the Middle East can just go to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, from the Gulf to Guada and then into China without going through other parts of the Indian Ocean. I mean, it's very, very strategic there. And then, of course, it's not, you know, China didn't stop there. Um, there's the China Myanmar Economic Corridor, very similar, uh, 2017. And it's for the oil pipelines from the coast into Kunming, which is southwestern China. Uh, and then going through a lot of branch infrastructural projects in Laos, in Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia. So you could see, you know, by linking the ocean ports, the special economic zones, privileging Chinese corporations and, and other kind of strategies, that it's basically linking Africa through South Asia to Southeast Asia and then to China over land routes if needed. And this is the uh, 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 Myanmar, you know, again, you know, the routes uh, uh, connecting Southeast Asia countries. And then of course the famous or the infamous, you know, Hamban Tota port, Sri Lanka, you know, China gave the elite, you know, the uh, uh, lavish loans, which uh, Sri Lanka couldn't repay. And in return, China secured 99 years of that port, right in the tip of India, 99 years. And of course, of course, India got very, very nervous because not only merchant ships, but obviously it can, you know, in times of emergency and war, you know, you can have Chinese, you know, uh, ships there, military. So that trap, it has, you know, because of the Sri Lanka case, there's a bit of uh, uh, talks about that trap. You know, this is, you know, part of the, you know, the waters surrounding the port there. Of course, there's uh, Cambodia, you know, Sheer Not View. Um, some of these are unfinished projects that China promises, but didn't go through, there was. And then the construction go further west. Here you see the Gulf region. There are daily flights uh, 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 from everywhere, from Guangzhou to Lagos to, to, to the Gulf and, and, and everywhere. 
Um, so it's here, you, you definitely know that the air networks also uh, in terms of infrastructure and then constructions. I was fascinated by, by what I saw in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, 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 and just the, 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 the speed and the intensity of city building, you know, mostly designed by European professionals, but then, and then also the technicians and the engineers are, are, are Indians and Chinese, and then um, the foreman and whatever was sort of further down the labor hierarchy. Um, then you have the Filipina uh, uh, sales persons in the shops, and then of course, a lot of Chinese um, uh, small scale uh, uh, entrepreneurs, but the, the infrastructure of the city was very impressive. This was taken in my hotel room at dawn in Doha, you know, it's very ghostly, but there they are, but represented, you know, in, in these uh, uh, advertisements for the Chinese buyers in Wenzhou, which is, you know, a big city south of Shanghai. Um, I, I think these Chinese investors lost a lot of money in 2008 during the financial bubble. But there were Chinese uh, um, uh, Chinatown news in Dubai. Um, uh, and then you also see on the ground, you know, uh, the fluidity of the people. Uh, technicians in Dubai airport, Chinese technicians, domestic helpers. I can't tell whether this is a Filipina or South, South Asia, Southeast Asian uh, uh, domestic helpers, but there they are. And then Baluchi Indian merchants who's been there for a long, long time. Uh, this is in Oman. Again, um, North Africans and um, um, in, in the, uh, this one is in Zanzibar. And then uh, Bangladeshi labor still doing all the hard work uh, together with North African laborers. There's a lot of cultural fusion, of course. Uh, uh, I see this fascinating picture I snapped in a market in Muscat, textiles from India and China. And then, you know, I can't tell the model, you know, what they represent, but it's definitely an uh, uh, interesting combination. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, well, there it is, just in a small market in Muscat. Oh. And then this one was also, I snapped that a few years back, it was at, at, at the Women's University in Dubai and they had a Japan night and there it was, you know, beautiful, the kimonos and, and, and the head dress and all that, there it was, very naturally just there. So more uh, China African encounters on the ground. You know, I picked a few places quickly, Tanzania, Guangzhou, and I'm going to skip Yiwu uh, because uh, of the interest of time. But from, with Tanzania, for example, it started early with China-Africa friendships, 60s and the 70s, when China was exporting socialism under Mao. There's that's Mao and Liu Xiaoqi and Zhou Enlai together with, um, with a uh, African uh, elite, uh, revolutionary leaders, just you know, soon after independence. And then welcoming uh, President Nyeri uh, 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 in, in probably Shanghai. I don't know, I couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. Medical services, China really contributed quite a bit to medical services for very, very needy people uh, at that time. Uh, and I think that the, the socialist help was genuine. Um, and then, Tanzam Railroad, which is very famous. Um, it's still there, operating, sort of uh, being renovated by the Chinese corporations. Stadiums that's sort of left unused now. Uh, but then there's also, uh, um, this is called the Mao Stadium, but uh, in Zanzibar. And then a new round of Chinese presence today. But mainly trade fairs from Chinese Southern China provinces. It's very interesting. Brands of China, there was like 19, you know, it, it was 2012 when we were there and it was like um, Guangzhou, 
uh, uh, Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Jiangsu. They are basically southeastern coastal provinces. So they were holding trade fairs. But they're selling all sorts of Chinese products like motorcycles cheaply, but, but they don't last very long. Mm -hmm. And then hardware, a lot of small businesses selling hardware to the African uh, 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 builders. Mm -hmm. Just in the markets, you see Chinese products everywhere. Um, even these imitation wax cloths that's produced in Guangzhou uh, for the Chinese, uh, for the African markets. And these, I mean, just think about the consequence of these kinds of flooding of the market of typically in you know, African indigenous, uh, not indigenous, but African, uh, um, uh, popular African uh, uh, daily use. Of course, you know, uh, uh, Chinese merchants in Egypt was making huge, huge profits from selling underwear. I, I, there's a huge story on that, but I, I don't have time to go over it, you know, because of the, and there, there were these men, Muslim men and their wives, you know, going to these shops and with no problem talking about what kind of underwear the wife should be wearing. I mean, this was fascinating. Uh, and there was, but the Chinese doesn't, they don't care, you know, they make lots and lots of inroad into even this very intimate corners of people's lives. Tourist, of course, uh, medical services, but no longer state uh, 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 subsidized, but basically this is run by a Shanghainese family for profit in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. But they're big ones seeing like a state. So you see huge, huge, you know, from agribusiness to mining to, to economic zones, and of course to others above, you know, a completely new Chinese style city. Here it is, you know, this is China's, you know, basic domination of the continent by having these, you know, the, 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 the countries in brown were basically signed up for the Belt and Road Initiative. So only a few uh, uh, holding uh, holding out. That is in uh, in East Africa, you know, like Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, you know that um, uh, here. Uh, lots of railroad networks that's done and funded and managed uh, uh, by uh, uh, Chinese companies, corporations, state corporations. Of course, the famous one is the, 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 the light rail from Addis Ababa all the way to Djibouti. That's for a very, very important, I think, military purpose, because Djibouti, you know, uh, um, what's given to China is exactly right next to the big uh, uh, US military uh, port there in Djibouti. The loans given to Africa, you know, from you know, all the way through and uh, 2016, that's all already reaching 30 billion. But of course, in the summit in 2018 in Beijing, Xi, Xi Jinping promises 60 billion and so on. And so huge projects have been built. This is just, you know, a Chinese manager waiting for its staff to come to the airport uh, in Tanzania. These are the new stadiums built now, high tech, beautiful. These are agricultural technology stations, growing very interesting. Um, rice and other Chinese crops, I have no idea why they're there. I mean, we're, we're there, we're looking, uh, we're being shown around. Um, um, Sisal Farm, also owned by Chinese joint ventures with Tan Tanzania government, um, cutting through basically agricultural land and also cutting through uh, um, I suspect um, Maasai country, you know, Maasai is this very, very uh, 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 herding um, societies. And so, you know, the, the Maasai people were really losing a lot of the areas where they can actually have their cattle. And so that's just some of the pictures. Um, 
But then, you know, roads, definitely roads. If you can look at this, you could tell that China basically dominate the engineering and the construction. The planning, some of it is with the Tanzania government and with some European uh, um, consultants, but mainly it's the, the Chinese uh, projects that's on the ground. You know, these roads hardly ever used by the Africans except bicycles. Uh, we actually were able to stop by a construction site by the Zhongtie, I think um, that is the Chinese railroad, you know, corporation. And on the excuse that you know, we need to find a toilet in, in the middle of nowhere, right? So we we bribed the <laughs> we bribed the the, 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 the god with the, this uh, you know, assault rifle, and we said we desperately need some, you know, uh, uh, need to go to a toilet, and we have, you know, you know, we have you know, white Americans and the Chinese and, you know, a mixture. And they let us in and we couldn't find a woman's toilet because it's all men, right? And so we have to drive the men out and then have our colleagues guard the entrance so that, you know, we get to use the toilet. But in the middle of that, while we were taking turns, you know, we were asking the Chinese foreman, a very, very sweet and gentle fellow, uh, because he's obviously, you know, living a very, very isolated life. And we said, well, what did you encounter when you built these roads just right cutting across people's you know, local communities? And his answer was very sad. And he said, you know, I have to say it in, in, in Chinese. He said, just like we That is just like what we encounter in China. Uh, and he was, you know, the, the Chinese foreman, he said, he's there, totally isolated, they grow their own food, raise their own chicken and vegetable, and then in three years time, he would go back and be able to build a house and have a wife. Uh, even his salaries were not paid in, in Tanzania, it was just paid back home in Chongqing. So development and displacement. I just want to show a couple pictures quickly. Uh, is that we're really running out of time? Uh, but uh, uh, this is from a, 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 a couple French journalists. I mean, of course, they had their point of view, but I thought the picture was very powerful. Just, you know, I don't need to explain. This was actually owned by a Chinese entrepreneur, which used to be for the German Council. you know, restaurants with successful young entrepreneurs. This was also fascinating, you know, this fellow who's, you know, and then with an umbrella and then this God, you know, holding, you know, this assault rival to protect him. Reminds me of, you know, the sea lord Zhang Zhilong, you know, having his 500 black guards. I mean, history just seems to be, report, you know, repeating right in front of my eyes. Uh, but what we see, you know, this was a picture I took of a landmark marking miles and miles and miles of land acquired by this Chinese company. We immediately looked it up on the web uh, as we were driving back to Dar es Salaam, and it was a company in Chongqing. That's what they're doing to drive to, to get rid of, you know, but it, maybe this is exactly like what China is going through too. Displaced people, the Maasai, you know, uh, uh, herdsmen being, you know, looking for work in Dar es Salaam. Um, school children who walk those roads built by the Chinese to go to school. But because now they are sort of pushed away into very marginal places. These were the villagers who met with us and was pleading with, you know, pleading to ask us to reach up to the higher ups, but what could we do? We were just a bunch of academics and I just feel very sorry. Um, you know, poverty, you know, um, you could see China pumping a lot of oil out of the continent, but the, its own people were trying to raid a, a, a tanker that was sort of stuck on the side of the road. It's extremely dangerous because it can explode anytime. Uh, and many incidences it, they did. The, the very interesting part here is this company, the China uh, uh, Tanzania Joint Ventures. Somebody put a big cross over it. 
that's just a sentiment. That's our team. This is a little, uh, we, we all look a little younger then. You could tell me sitting on top of, you know, on, on the knees of my colleagues. But let's go right back to the last thing now Africans in Guangzhou. Guangzhou, um, they were living uh, at the height of the African communities. There's 100,000 of them in this city. Uh, I would skip the statistics. Uh, you know, if you see the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, they were all on the edges living in these so-called urban villages, cheap, substandard housing, they were con congregating there, uh, mixed Chinese African neighborhoods. This is, this is where a lot of them are, you know, against the, the elegant, uh, office towers but through the smoke you have to see and then these are just you know uh, visa offices there the range of goods it's very very from low end to high end now cheap clothing wholesale markets you know selling for a muslim population uh, reminds me again of again 18th century guangzhou but now we have jeans, we have African cloth, we have electronics, cell phones, and the diversity of traders is fascinating. Mostly West Africa, but Anglophone, Francophone, um, uh, Muslims and Christians. There they are. This is Guangzhou with their Chinese laborers you know, this is just one of the streets in that area. Uh, and the Chinese, you know, locals very, very, I found that uncomfortably racist and they call this whole area Chocolate City. It's bad, but there it is. That's why I said, you know, race is not, not purely a black and white matter. This is illegal money changes. That's why we blur, blur the faces and Good luck for this couple trying to get a taxi. The strategy is to have them hire a young assistant, Chinese. She would go and flag down the taxi and then they all, you know, sort of <laughs> go right into the taxi. But, you know, there were leisurely moments and mixed couples, even African restaurant services it's not just food i mean medical services all sorts you know in multiple languages you know i could i can tell i mean there's arabic there's french there's you know you you, you name it you know men problems you know uh, i'm sure women problem too but there they are but the community was you know gelled together by religion that's very interesting because if you think hard, you know, with China's present anti-religion, you know, policies, how long can these communities hold together, particularly Christian and Muslims? That's the biggest cathedral in, in, in China that's built by French uh, uh, missionaries in 1870s, I think, 60s, 70s. Sacred Heart Cathedral on a Sunday afternoon. That's all you see, Africans, families. And they're not poor. These are pretty wealthy uh, families with their children, you know, mixing uh, 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 friendships. And then after this, the, 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 the Catholic uh, 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 service, they would retire to a, a smaller place right next door. And these kind of very African Christian uh, churches, and they would continue the services for another three hours. And, you know, you could see, I mean, we're very much, you know, the minority there. So I'm going to skip Yiwu. I'm sorry. I mean, the, it's just that the commodities remind me again of 18th century Guangzhou. They even sell shirts on a machine. You know, 
and they built an 8,000 people mosque that's in Yiwu. And this is the nightlife. I showed it to a, a colleague of mine uh, 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 at Yale, and he said, where, where were you? <laughs> I said, in Yiwu, south of Shanghai. And he said, wow, wow, there it is. But there are these sites of refuge and mediation along the Belt and Road. And I really want to just flip a few things on Hong Kong just to get, give you, you know, to, 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 to you know, sort of maintain my analytical point about why I want to show what Hong Kong was and what Hong Kong has become. You know, British colony, landscapes of power in the past, St. John's Cathedral, HSBC, Standard Charter Bank, and then the local Li Ka Shing's uh, uh, headquarter, the local Ch uh, Hong Kong Chinese capital. They are obviously shrinking. And also at the time, you know, in the past, this Chinese temples and, 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 and so on, also a big uh, uh, cultural power there. But of course, increasingly it was taken over by, by the Chinese capital. And this is the Bank of China, uh, sharply pointing at uh, HSBC. People said that, you know, that's feng sui, that's geomancy. But uh, HSBC continued to stand for another 20 years. But, you know, Lippo Center, which is a Southeast Asian uh, uh, capital next door, it just collapsed. So <laughs> something's there. Uh, um, and then, uh, Hang Seng, you know, stock market, Chinese enterprises index. You could tell the the high bar is basically financials. So China basically took oh, probably about eighty percent of uh, Hong Kong's stock exchange values now. But there's very vibrant two systems uh, that a lot of Hong Kongers identify with over the, the, the centuries. And when I talk Hong Kongers, I don't mean the ethnic Chinese local Hong Kongers. It's a lot of foreigners, a lot of mixed people, South Asians, whatever, who came and went, came and went over the centuries. And they deposited institutions and values in that place and they took slices of it back. And they make, they, many of them identify themselves as Hong Kongers as well. So this is a bricolage of, of all sorts of, 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 from architecture to culture, ethnicity, basically. This is a normal daily life in, in, in Hong Kong. Indonesian domestic helpers, you know, very exploitative labor conditions there for them. But they also found you know, certain empowering moments. I took, I snapped this picture with the idea that I was going to give it to, to my editor at Harvard University Press for, for my book cover. I said, it represents everything, the layers of meaning, world capitalism, consumption, everything. And there you have an Indonesian maid in her, you know, her, her, her jeep, right? and then taking a selfie. I said, wonderful book cover for, Asia inside out itinerant peoples. Well, it took the, the editor like three minutes to reply and said, no, that's it. <laughs> my, my colleague, Eric Tagagoso even suggested because he, he loved the picture. He said, can we just put our name down there to block something that's a little bit too explicit? And I said, no, Eric, I don't want my name there. <laughs> anyway, we debated, but we didn't get through. But the enabling move, uh, moment for these, you know, mates too, that's Hong Kong. And of course, cultural, you know, unconventional thing. This is, you know, I was talking about Denise Ho, the, 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 the male opera, you know, uh, you know, figure was her. And Cantonese opera is very, very known for cross-dressing and, and, you know, sort of the gender boundaries are very, very uh, um, uh, fluid. That's her too, when she's, you know, because she's fluently French, uh, Canadian French, um, and she was uh, modeling for uh, big corporations like Louis Vuitton and, and, and other French cosmetics. And the reason that places even like HSBC were very, very tolerant of LGBT 
LGBTO. By the way, Denise is a very big promoter of LGBT uh, issues in Asia. And so HSBC, you know, amazingly, you found HSBC siding with some of these LGBT values, not, I think, I mean, I, I might be wrong, but I, 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 I think I guess right, that this is a, 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 over a, a court case, uh, you know, between a, a, an executive of a bank in Hong Kong, uh, whose same sex partner was denied uh, 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 some kind of residency rights. And HSBC and a few other banks actually came out supporting uh, the person uh, uh, fighting in the courts. Uh, and, you know, in this case, I was walking past the headquarters of HSBC downtown Hong Kong and found this rainbow color <laughs> lion, the icon of HSBC, you know, in support. So I just thought, that, oh, this is sort of fun. But you're gone. Gra you know, gradually, I would say, but in the last couple of years, it's very, very fast and intense. One country, two systems at a tipping point, I would say. Uh, China exerted control uh, since 2014 in very, very intense ways. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, there was the movement called Occupied Central, uh, 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 peace, you know, basically peaceful movement among the young uh, students uh, using umbrellas to fight the police. Um, I don't think I have time to show these, no. So I'll skip. Uh, but then there were still people, you know, from 2014 up to 2019, there was still a lot of popular culture, including people like, you know, Denise Ho and others using popular music to try to make some social political points. Uh, and of course, paid very heavy price. There she was in a street concert when even Louis Vuitton, I don't know, it's Lancome, this one, uh, denied her sponsor, you know, she, they were sponsoring her, but then, you know, and then withdrew. But it was still a lot of what we call uh, defiance and, you know, uh, unity and divines. I got to show this at, at least a little bit just to show she was able to sing uh, uh, in these huge stadiums, even in 2016, that was her last major concert. Uh, just to get your sense of singing in front of 50,000 people. Very high tech and captures the imagination of Asia's young generation. That was 2016. That's probably the last of this kind of color and, and different voices. Hong Kong on fire, summer and fall. I was there quite a bit of time participating in the VAP rallies. One million people, two million people. They were all legitimate, I have to say, and whoever's watching um, uh, at the time. Packed like sardines, you no, know, just clocked every street you could imagine in, in the city in 90 degree weather and marching sometimes for eight hours. And there we were. And obviously getting tear gassed too. That's one picture I took, 2019. That was the highest number was two million people. This is downtown Hong Kong, Admiralty. Just look at the orderly crowd. I took this too. I thought that was 
very orderly too. At the time, it's the beginning of the movement. So the police were not, you know, very, you know, militarized at the time. And people were still using their umbrellas and all that. It took, you know, and there, there's this picture, August 18, 1.7 million people in the rain. These were young mothers, one of the marches. And uh, these are Hong Kong's probably middle, upper middle class, educated, young. And the bulk of uh, the, the basis for Hong Kong's uh, a professional class. Then you see tension becoming more and more on both extremes, I would say. Uh, but the bulk of it is in the middle. Uh, this is right downtown central. You see City Bank was right behind us. And, and I don't know whether this family was just taking a walk deliberately or just caught by chance with very heavily armed police. There they were. Ethnic supporters of the, of the protesters. Lunch breaks in Central. Uh, may I show a minute of each? I just want to get a sense of how at that time in the middle of the finance center, this is, you know, some of it are these very luxurious malls. People were singing and they did nothing, you know, that's threatening. They were just singing. I don't know how, I don't know how to activate this. They were singing a song called Glory. These are the very fancy walls. Look at them. They're singing all across the city. It's an act of defiance. People of all ages try really hard to sing this song. Some people may sing it off key or not know the melody, but they still sing it really loudly. And then there's counter singing by the pro-government groups too, waving Chinese flag. I mean, that's what I mean. The, the beauty of Hong Kong is that you can have so many voices engaging with each other in rather peaceful moments. That's why people stayed in Hong Kong for all this. But then, you know, it's not easy. I just want to show one last clip. This is right next to the exchange, you know, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. It was a lunch break, people were gathering, police moved in, making a rest. Somebody threw an umbrella over his head and it triggered. Just look at the onlookers, people who try to intervene. People were trying to argue with the police. Oh, 
Right behind is the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. These are people in business suits. So I took this one just for, <laughs> I don't know, with some sadness and sort of tongue in cheek. A lot of graffiti was sort of written, uh, right? This is downtown Hong Kong, right next to the landmark. So it was really, really sort of center. And somebody wrote something about Hong Kong or revenge. That's the word. But obviously the government wanted the, the cleaners to just you know, cover it up. And so the cleaners did but they just cover up the words. So it makes it about 10 times bigger. <laughs> it was, I call that weapons of the week. So upholding the rule of law. Just, just want to show. So that's what we used to have. Let me just go directly. Last seven months that have concerned the every person of the in our community. Former Chief Justice. Many questions have been raised regarding the judiciary. Many commentaries have been given as to the work of the courts, and many views have been expressed regarding our judges. Article 85 of the Basic Law states that the courts of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall exercise judicial power independently, free from any interference. The task of the courts is to resolve legal disputes in accordance with the law. Everyone is subject to the law, no one is above it. The guarantee and requirement of equality, which is also clearly spelt out in the basic law uh, and the Bill of Rights, ensures that everyone, high or low, public body or citizen are subject to the law and answerable to it. There are no exceptions. The duty on the courts to enforce the law is a constitutional requirement of the basic law. I can say with confidence that my fellow judges and I will discharge our duties without compromise and without fear. Today marks the final occasion I will be addressing you at the opening of the legal year as I will be retiring when I reach retirement age in January next year. Yes, there is still much work for me to complete, but I wish to say this. It has been the greatest privilege of my professional life to be Hong Kong's second Chief Justice. The rule of law is rightly cherished by the community and is the foundation of a cohesive society. We must do all our best to preserve it and to treasure it because once damaged, this is not something from which our community can easily recover. I'm not going to show this purely because of the time limit and also because they might, you know, do harm to the people in the film. And I feel very sorry. If Hong Kong remains a financial center, uh, or, you know, with all the rule of law, with the stability, with the cultural vibrancy, with people committing themselves to, to the city and, and its happenings. I think we need uh, some of the basic institutions and values um, that can be retained. And I think destroying it, as the Chief Justice said, you know, uh, it will be difficult and a long time to recover. And what I worry most, I mean, the reason I show these is not to promote any political point of view, but to show that if these institutions are destroyed and so fast and so intense in the past year and a half, I think Hong Kong may cease to become a very vibrant capital market for China to finance all its infrastructural projects, not only in Africa, 
but also in the entire Belt and Road. And I think in the long run, it may hurt China's interest. So I just wish that somehow China will be able to consider and to appreciate what Hong Kong can offer uh, and its uniqueness. If not, will will be something like this. I took this tongue in cheek that was in 2006 in a cat street in Hong Kong, in this little market. But I hope that we, that's the only thing left. I hope that Hong Kong would not be like this, but rather to be like this for all concerned, including China. So that's the end of it. I'm, I'm sorry that I, I, I keep you all waiting here, but it's a long story, it's a complicated story. It's very multi-level, both in space and time. But I just hope to show that somehow we are missing some analytical pieces if we don't put this very, very uh, interactive Asian arena in the picture, if we think about China, Africa, or the Belt and Road. Thank you for your patience. You are all invited to ask questions now. My colleague um, Alex uh, will be passing around the microphone. Um, but um, while you are thinking, perhaps I uh, ask the first question. You, um, a lot of what you said um, dealt with um, the notion of activism, both in Hong Kong and also you touched upon it a little bit also in Africa. And when you started your talk, you said, you know, there are these uh, people or protests um, because of the environment, workers' laws, um, the consummation of pork. Can you say a little bit more about that and who, who these people are, how they, how they organize their activism, and perhaps also a little bit in terms of um, the numbers. How many people are we talking about? You know, is this really something? Uh, numbers, yeah. that's, uh, I deliberately yeah. avoided the numbers. Okay. <laughs> I have my fact sheet there, and I, uh, um, but uh, I think generally, Africa is a very big continent, as you can tell. So, and the interesting thing is that for Africa, China is sometimes soft on certain regions and hard on the others. So it's very difficult to gauge who's, you know, you know, you know, the reactions. And of course, you have to factor in the 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 governments, the nature of the governments. I think most of the the instability, that which might hurt, you know, China's interest, is in 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 countries where there's a lot of of discontent local discontent against its own government. And so when there are serious corruption charges between the Chinese corporations or Chinese state in some sense, state corporations and the local elites and, 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 and projects, that's when a lot of the anger flared mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So I think it, 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 it has to, de to do with the, 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 the African society's own you know, internal uh, uh, turmoil. And so the Chinese coming in actually then triggers a lot right. of these things. Um, and then I would say Muslim countries may be a little bit more fearful for China mm -hmm. because its own record mm -hmm. in, in Xinjiang and in other places. Uh, but, um, but it's very hard to quantify, I think, a lot of it is not known, even though right. that mm -hmm. actually African media is amazingly mm -hmm. transparent, especially um, in the um, uh, 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 in the British and also in the German former colonies. They have mm -hmm. great traditions of media freedom and transparency. <coughs> so we hear a lot. Mm -hmm. So whatever I've gathered, basically from not just the Western press, but um, press in 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 uh, English. Mm -hmm. Press uh, from from Africa, and of course Chinese media is an Al Jazeera for all that mm. matter too. I mean, the reporting of a particular incident can be from so many angles, so mm. it's hard to quantify yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, someone from um, from Zoom is asking, um, and I read the question. Your description of Chinese socialism seems more like colonial capitalism. 
I've spoken to Africans who believe that the Chinese in Africa are worse than the Euro uh, old European colonizers. What do you think of taking countries by force to participate in a total totalitarian state? Can you, yeah, can you address some of the Africans' concerns? Yeah, I mean, just give you an example. You know, a few years ago, at the height of enthusiasm from Yale about China-African uh, relationships, we had a big conference held, and there were representatives from Beijing, uh, from China anyway, um, and also from um, indigenous, uh, not indigenous, but from African countries, you know, basically uh, colleagues and professionals, and of course some American colleagues. And I remember uh, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, Chinese colleague from Beijing, actually, um, she made her speech and she was, it was obviously a script. She said, we are so lucky that unlike the Western colonizers, we had always been friends to China. And, and she was just going to continue. And an African scholar stood up at the panel and said, you might have been a friend in the past, but you may not be one now. She didn't know what to say, and she's sort mm -hmm. of there. I think there's a lot of that among the intellectual circles mm -hmm. of the discontent about what China is up to and, and starting to make um, uh, uh, comments. And I think it coincided with you know, some of the, the, the data I showed. You know, a particular person is a journalist from Colombia um, by the name of Howard French. Uh, she and Deborah Brodigan, you know, from, from Johns Hopkins have been just arguing for years and years. And they tend to, you know, Howard and, and the more so anti-China kind of, of sentiments would feel that because of the dominance in, in China's economic power uh, um, and also uh, political dominance, dominance and through soft power, if you think about all the satellite networks and all that, it's basically uh, Chinese owned and Chinese beamed with Chinese programs and, and there's 200 some Confucian t uh, institutes in, in, uh, in Africa uh, um, financing huge numbers of African professionals to, to Beijing and other places to learn language and to network. So you could see that the Western democracies are losing out. And so again, what I worried about is not whether there's just one or the other, but if, if there's some kind of balancing and checking and balance and mediation, I think the world will be so much more stable. Whereas if you have China basically sort of taking over, then sometimes it may not even be the, the intention of the state, but there are so many layers of stakeholders, you know, from the central government to the provincial government to the ministries to all the way down to the private entrepreneurs, what they what they do sometimes get latched on to the government's, the Chinese government's responsibility, even though it might not have been the intention. So it's very complicated mm -hmm. to say whether China is a colonial power or whether it's not. But I did uh, um, answer some of my colleagues in Zurich years ago when I was critically sort of hinting at what China has been doing in the environment in some of the worst abuses um, not blaming Chinese government at the time at all, but I'm just pointing out places to look. Um, and a, a liberal colleague of mine from Zurich stood up and said, look, Helen, you know, you, know, you Americans did something pretty bad too, right? Um, and look at the British colonial, look at the Belgian, look at, you know, you know, they've done all that to Africa. My answer is very simple. I said, by criticizing one party, in this case, because my focus was on China, I said, by criticizing one party doesn't mean I condone the others. I said, where's your logic, right? And I said, also, uh, um, you know, if I really were to take lessons from the past colonial, uh, 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 you know, damages and, and, and horrible problems created for these African countries. I would learn from them rather than to use them as excuses to justify my own mistakes today. <laughs> so that's my straight answer. But then I said, but there is a difference between the colonial past uh, 
and then what China is doing. Um, because I see something happening already, you know, in this late socialist globalization, which is no longer based on sort of neoliberal markets. So I said, in the past, even uh, with the worst colonial abuses, you still have people of conscience within those countries, like the missionaries, like NGOs, like whatever, who would go against their government on behalf of the local societies. But today, I think it will be more difficult for the Chinese of people of conscience in China to act in those terms. And that's bad. We have a second part to this evening. Um, there is a dinner that is awaiting you. And um, I see that you are still a little bit shy in asking questions. So perhaps the dinner and uh, the wine will help you. So what we thought is perhaps we can um, move to the dinner room. And then uh, you can uh, think about further questions. And you are most welcome uh, to answer them. And I thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you, um, Helen, for a fascinating presentation and lecture. You will have to work over dinner. And um, there are some more questions over Zoom, and perhaps uh, you will be able to answer them via email. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, and please share those with me, and then yeah. I can try to answer if I know who, who they are. Of course, <laughs> of course. Because I know there yeah. are people Zooming in yeah. from China as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you I, so I, much. I, 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 I,